Um, delighted you can join us today. I'm Kerry Oppenheim and I'm leading the Nuffield Foundation's Changing Face of Early Childhood project. And today we're publishing our second review, Protecting Young Children at Risk of Abuse and Neglect. And I'm joined by my co-author, Jordan Rahill, who will present the insights and findings from the report, and Andrew Webb, hugely experienced as a leader of children's services, also former president of the Association of the, the Directors of Children's Services and a member of the Nuffield Found, um, Family Justice Observatory Governing Board. And Andrew will draw out some of the key issues that he thinks we should be focusing on now and in the future. Um, Please do contribute your ideas and questions um, uh, in, in, in the Q&A and we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as we can in the webinar or return to them at a later stage. So I thought I'd begin just by setting the scene for our discussion. Um, the Changing Face of Early Childhood uh, is a series and it reflects the importance of this phase of life when the foundations for children's development are laid. Um, the series explores the striking changes in the lives of the under fives and their families if we look back over the last 20 years, it's underpinned by two key themes. The first is really the changing nature of family life, the greater variety and complexity of family forms, the way people organize their work and care, and then the inequalities between children. That's both entrenched inequalities and new inequalities, and what this means for children's well-being. And the plan is that over this year, we'll distill over 18 Nuffield Foundation funded research studies and other key research, capture what we've learned, uh, be clear about what we, what we don't know, um, and in, throughout this process, engage with others to develop a series of evidence-informed recommendations to improve the lives of young children, especially for the most disadvantaged. Of course, we're at a critical moment, um, firstly, and, and front of mind today, the pandemic and the un unprecedented pressure it's put on families with young children, especially those who are struggling. There's early evidence of increasing domestic violence and abuse, mental health difficulties and financial stress. And this has depleted the resources and not just the financial resources, but also the emotional and wider family support that families can draw upon. And not surprisingly, this affects and disrupts family relationships, parenting and children's welfare. But at the same time as all of those challenges, the crisis has also generated a surge of community activity and opened up some new ways of working and collaborating, as well as using digital communications to reach and engage with some families. Secondly, we have the opportunity of the government's independent review of children's social care, which marks a real opportunity to stand back and rethink in an ambitious way about system change. And thirdly, this topic, the, the focus of today, matters because the experience of abuse or neglect, whether at birth or infancy, which is our focus today, or at an older age, is deeply damaging at the same at, at, at the time and can be long afterwards stretching into adulthood and sometimes intergenerationally. But many of the challenges we face are, are long-standing. We've seen an increase in child poverty and other forms of deprivation since 2013-14, tipping some families into vulnerability. There's an intensification of poverty, more families with children experiencing poverty for longer and falling into deeper poverty. These are issues we explore in a, in a forthcoming review. And the work by Paul Bywaters and colleagues shows that families with children growing up in deprived neighbourhoods are more likely to experience a child welfare intervention and their marked differences by ethnic minority group. And understanding this intersectionality is going to be really vital for having effective responses. 
And we've also seen an increase in the numbers of very young children in care proceedings, what Karen Broadhurst has, taught, has termed born into care. And more recent data from Wales shows a strong association with poor maternal mental health. And we've seen a shift in the reasons for young children having a child protection plan with neglect and emotional abuse accounting for an increasing proportion of those plans. And an, a, another key trend is the hollowing out of what we call the middle tier of services, the shifting from upstream preventative early intervention community-based services for families with children to statutory responses. So, so big and marked changes, but at the same time, we have key opportunities. And the things I'd like to explore today is what do we as a society need to do to give this group of children the best start in life? How do we build on family and community strengths? And given the financial pressures on local authority budgets, past and now, and growing need, how do we enable a really far reaching and innovative approach to how services, family, kin, community and financial support are designed and delivered? So that's trying to set the scene for you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jordan, who's going to sort of delve into to some of the highlights of the review before we turn to Andrew. So over to you, Jordan. Thanks, Carrie. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jordan Rehill. I'm a researcher at the Foundation and a co-author of this review. So over the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to give us a brief overview of the latest review of the Changing Face of Early Childhood series. And this particular review explores the systems designed to support young children at risk of abuse and neglect. So before I begin, I just want to outline the aims of the review and the rationale behind the scope. So the themes and the areas of interest covered in this paper, in this review, are drawn largely from research funded by the Nuffield Foundation over the last eight to 10 years. And we've essentially tried to collate a rather disparate and um, a disparate body of work into a coherent narrative about young children at risk of abuse and neglect. So we focus on children under five in the child welfare system and family justice system in England and Wales. And of course, we know that not all children in care or on protection plans or in need will be there because of abuse and neglect, though most under five are. We know that there are a host of other vulnerabilities that we don't cover in this review. So for example, some children may be vulnerable due to family dysfunction or related to a special educational need or disability. So the first and large question is in relation to prevalence. So how many young children are at risk? So in 2019, so this is pre-pandemic, analysis by the Children's Commissioner's Office for England estimated that some half a million children under five were living in a household with domestic abuse, parental mental health problems, or parental drug and alcohol abuse. So this equates to around 17% of the under five population. And prior to the pandemic, it's really quite difficult to say with certainty whether child maltreatment, abuse and neglect have been increasing or decreasing over the long term in England and Wales. So data used by both the NSPCC and ONS abuse surveys suggest that overall prevalence may be decreasing slightly. But these surveys are drawn on a retrospective recall of historic abuse, people reflecting back and reporting on their experiences. And we know that there's strong and ample evidence of both under and over reporting in similar studies. And as Kerry mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're actually beginning to see the early signs that the risk factors around abuse and neglect may be increasing as a result of the increased pressures caused by the pandemic. 
we can also see that more children and newborns are in care proceedings. So this figure shows the number of children in care proceedings per 10,000 over time in England. It's first of all important to set these findings within the wider context. So we're aware of the, the rapidly growing proportion of children coming into the care system in their teenage years and age 16 and above. But this slide is a reflection of the focus of this review. So that's the under fives. So this research, as Kerry mentioned, led by Professor Karen Broadhurst and her team at Lancaster, has shown that the rate of children born into care proceedings, so that's being involved in care proceedings within a week of being born, has more than doubled in England between 2008 and 2016. So that's that yellow line on the figure that you can see. And we've seen similar patterns of increase in subsequent work in Wales. So in 2016, 2017, the most recent point of analysis for England, around 2,500 newborn babies were in care proceedings in England because they were thought to be at risk of significant harm. And what the research also uncovered is marked differences in the number and rate of infants being removed from their parents' care. So regional differences, I should say. So London, as may be expected, is a world apart from Wales and many regions of England, particularly the Northwest, the Northeast and Yorkshire and the Humber. So new research, which is updating these figures, is due to be published by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory in the coming months. And it shows a continued upward trend in the volume of care proceedings for newborns. We also know, you know, a little bit more around the wider circumstances of these mothers, of the mothers of these children. So, for example, we know around half will not have had a child taken into care before this, this first proceedings. So debates continue, I guess you'd say, whether child welfare intervention rates are too high. In other words, whether the state intervenes too readily in families' lives. It's worth saying that it appears the higher rates of um, intervention are not driven by more referrals. So we know in England that local authorities, uh, that referrals to local authorities, I should say, increased by 7% in the last decade, while local authorities carried out 79% more assessments. But what this data doesn't tell us is, because, is whether this increase in assessments is because of lower initial risk thresholds applied, applied by local authorities, or change in the nature of referrals being made or other factors. As Kerry mentioned at the top of the presentation, we can see that a growing proportion of children under five are being referred to services because of emotional abuse and neglect compared to 20 years ago. However, it's really quite difficult to know what, you know, the extent to which this increase is because of actual increases in abuse and neglect, more reporting, more risk averse social work practice, cuts to preventative services. I think we know that in, in all likelihood, it's probably a combination of all of these. It also remains quite unclear whether different risks are being identified or if the same behaviors are regarded as riskier to children than they would have been previously. We do have more concrete data, I would say, when looking at spending. So this figure shows the overall changes in spending on children's services over the last decade. We only have data up to 2017-18. Uh, the light green section is spending on preventative services, so children's centres and other early help. That dark green section is spending on statutory services, so spending on children in care, for example. And what we can see is spending on statutory services and acute services for children at risk has largely been protected and instead we are seeing a, a hollowing out of the middle, as Kerry mentioned. And what we mean here is a reduction in the services that help identify and support families and young children who are under pressure and struggling. So we know in England, spending on preventative services fell from £3.8 billion in 2011 to £2.1 billion in 2018. We know that there are serious and growing concerns about whether both child welfare and the family justice systems can be sustained with current levels of demand and resourcing. We know, for example, that councils in England overspent on children's social care by £800 million in 2018, 2019. And we're also beginning to see the pressure COVID-19 is placing on local finances. 
So the National Audit Office announced last week that we, the vast majority of English councils are preparing to make cuts to services to balance the books next year. And it's likely there will be these same preventative services taking the hit. We also know that the chance of experiencing a child welfare intervention is not experienced equally across all families and that poverty is a driving factor. So research conducted by a team led by Professor Paul Bywaters, as Kerry mentioned, has shown that the likelihood of being taken into care or placed on a child protection plan varies substantially depending on where a child lives. So we know that roughly one in every 60 children in the most deprived communities was in care compared to one in every 660 in the least deprived. So in other words, children living in the poorest neighborhoods are at least 10 times more likely to be in care than in the richest neighborhoods. And the research also suggests that this relationship is stronger for younger children. And what we can also see and what the research tells us is there are huge inequalities between ethnic groups in child welfare intervention rates. And we can also see that these inequalities exist within ethnic groups that are commonly conflated in policy responses. So one example, and this is just one example, is that national data tells us that children in the Asian census category are typically underrepresented in the care system. And there is an assumption that this is because of a culture of large extended families and support in Asian communities. But when you look into the data, as Paul and his team have, what you can see is there are really stark differences between Bangladeshi, Pakistani and Indian children, with Indian children rarely the subject of children's services involvement. And we also know that the rates differ according to the level of deprivation in, in the neighbourhood. So what do we make of these findings? So in general, I think we can say that these inequalities, this disproportionality is poorly understood and little attention has been paid to them in children's services or within, fam or within the family justice system. But the implications of these differences are, are really quite profound. We can't be comfortable as a society, as a, as a system with these inequalities, but we need better information to understand what is going on and to know what strategies might be helpful to reduce these inequalities. And this must include working with communities to understand their experiences of social services interventions, and especially among communities with lower intervention rates. So, as you can see from the slide, and this is a partial look at the system, we have a very busy and fragmented system of support for vulnerable children and families. So the relationship between universal services, so those available to all children and families, and targeted services, those directed at particular groups, including families and children at risk, is a complex one. So in an, in an ideal system, these services, so whether that's health visitors and GPs, children's social care, or wider social support, like for example, the Troubled Families Programme, and early education would be more coordinated to ensure that children at acute risk are taking up universal offers. In reality though, we have a quite a siloed approach to service provision, which means that these services are often treated as independent bodies. And as a result, many families continue to fall through the gaps. And there continues to be a lack of national data or information on how services are currently being organized. And from the, from the anecdotal evidence that we do have, it's clear that there's some excellent local practice, but there's also considerable regional and local variation in the offer for children. Data and information sharing, I guess, is only, is only a small part of the issue. What really needs to change are the structures and pathways through and between services. So the next decade we'll see, as, as, you know, as we know, both universal and targeted services under massive demand and resource pressure, possibly more so than we've seen in recent years. And unless I think there's a fundamental restructuring of services, we're going to see them become more protectionist with incre increased reliance on ring fencing to keep them alive. So unless collaboration is a bedrock principle, I think we're gonna see some of them quickly fall away. 
So this review and this presentation so far has outlined some of what we have learned about young children at risk. However, it's important to say that much is, is actually still unknown, unknown. So it's surprising, considering how much data we collect on children at risk, that we often aren't able to use it to inform policy and practice in a satisfactory way. So for example, so nationally, I can access the DfE's data and see how many children under five are currently looked after. I can see the primary reason they became looked after, their legal status and their broad ethnic group. What I can't see is what their, for example, what their fi family financial situation was prior to them coming into care. I can't see how many children were living in an area of high deprivation, for example. I also can't see how many children had health or mental health issues outside of a broad strength and difficulties assessment. I also can't see their journey through the system. I can't see whether or how many children were a child in need before coming into care or how long they were a child in need. And for the under fives in particular, I don't know how many children attended nursery or an early years setting. I also don't know how many children reached a good level of development before starting school. And I also know very, very little about their parents. And what this, I guess what this tells us is there are really significant gaps in the admin data and a worrying lack of linkage between these data sets. So often, but you know, not always, this data is collected, but it's held by different government departments, you know, nationally and locally. And without more granular data, it's really quite difficult to confidently say whether too many or too few children are in these systems, let alone whether the right children are. And we also know that children in care and on protection plans and in need are sorely underrepresented in cohort studies. It's also worth saying, I think, that quantitative data can really only get us so far. So there are relatively few qualitative studies tracking processes and journeys from different perspectives. So drawing on lived experience, especially for the youngest children, must be an essential part of building up the evidence in this area. And I think, you know, everyone would probably agree that all of these gaps really serve to limit our ability to create evidence informed policy. So just a quick summary in terms of what we've learned. So we've seen a startling rise in the rate and number of children under one in the child welfare system. We've seen a sharp reduction in funding for preventative services. And we've also begun to uncover significant inequalities in child welfare intervention rates, according to local deprivation and ethnicity. I've only touched on some of those patterns here. We can also see the signs of a fragmented system of support for young children and their families. And we can also see clear data and evidence gaps related to children under five at risk. So what should we make of this large and disparate body of work? So the independent review of children's social care, as Kerry mentioned at the top of the presentation, it, that is currently underway, I think is a recognition that our system of child protection and support needs to be re-evaluated. So over time, we've seen a shift away from early support to help families who are struggling towards later interventions that are more likely to separate families and which are more expensive to provide. And I think it's clear that we need to move away from asking whether the state is intervening too much or too little and consider whether instead st the state and state agencies are intervening in the right way to prevent harm and promote positive outcomes for young children. So that is all for me. So I'll pass back now to Kerry and Andrew. Thank you very much, Jordan, for, for really laying out the, the, the key issues and, and we'll come back to them um, once Andrew, you've had a chance to respond. So over to you, Andrew, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, um, uh, Kerry and, and uh, Jordan for that and uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to read the draft report, which um, I think is probably not available to everybody who's listening. Um, and I read it very much with the ADCS uh, recent safeguarding pressures report in my mind and, and the Jordan just referenced the care review, the, the terms of reference for the care review, because there's, there's a lot of um, contextual information. Um, but the, the studies um, include a lot of information about um, early childhood and, and, and what's working well, which 
which haven't been pulled out yet in the uh, in the presentation. And I suppose it goes without saying that there's huge value in research findings that can be used to address individual differences and to uh, drive evidence informed practice, uh, whether it's following up on lo the long term impact of um, uh, adverse childhood experiences or trauma, or whether it builds on our capacity to compensate for neurobiological damage in early life. Um, and even better if that research helps identify strengths and protective factors. Uh, but from my point of view, if we, if we don't create and maintain systems with the capacity to manage complexity and sustain family interventions, there's almost no point in knowing what the damage is to individual children because we'll never fix it. The two have got to go hand in hand. So while I was reading uh, and, and reflecting um, on the, the recurrent question in the, in the review that Jordan just highlighted, do we have too much state intervention in family life or too little? I was also wondering whether the findings suggested we should uh, actively be looking to change and improve our practice to fit with our long-standing legislative and policy framework, um, which is something I've been trying to do for a long time or whether frankly we should give up and and because our policies are proving too aspirational we've never managed to implement the children act 89 we should just scale back our ambition and fit our practice uh, to our budget and reality um, now obviously i'm not really advocating that but we're at that sort of turning point um, we really are. And, and the gaps between the least and the most effective systems that have been highlighted are pretty wide and they need to be addressed. And in the limited time I've got today, I thought I'd concentrate on the systemic challenges identified by the research rather than pick up some of the strengths in the individual research programs. So in order to keep focused, um, I've grouped my thoughts about the review into three themes. Firstly, what did it tell us about the nature of state intervention in family life? Secondly, uh, what are the big issues behind the variation in system responses and the apparent disproportionality of action in some cases or some places, more, more usually places? Um, and finally, what are the implications of the fragmentation and hollowing out of services that the, uh, uh, the, the review uh, describes? So just a snapshot from my perspective as a, a long-standing uh, lo local government uh, officer on um, you know, where this might take us. So firstly, the, the nature of state intervention. Um, what does land, language tell us about underlying values? Um, I haven't got time to open the discourse about culture wars here, but for me, this has been a sort of wearying 40 year battle. There are pejorative terms littered throughout the research and the recent publication of the Public Law Working Group report uh, a couple of weeks ago all use language that implies that state intervention in family life is a bad thing. Specifically, being known to children's services is a marker of failure as a parent. The welfare state, a good thing, enhanced by the Children Act 1989, another good thing, creates a model designed to support families, to work in partnership with parents and to address need. And coincidentally, when the Children Act 1989 was enacted, it was estimated that possibly 17% of the child population might fall into the category of children in need and therefore be eligible for some sort of state support. And that's precisely the same proportion of under fives estimated by this review to experience domestic abuse, parental drug use or, or parental mental ill health. But rather than invest in targeted adult-focused services, the systemic response over time has been to create a label, the toxic trio, and use it as a reason to remove children and to police parenting. And for me, the, the big question here is, how on earth did the shift from welfare state to nanny state occur? How do we let this language underpin disinvestment in early support um, so that struggling parents uh, are no longer getting the help they need and we anticipate, it was anticipated they get in the 89 Act. And spending on care with its really, really very mixed impact on outcomes is going up exponentially. So that's, I suppose, the, the first uh, set of questions. And I think the review points out, um, secondly, uh, how an adversarial system and culture of judgment distort our services. Uh, so 
first thought from me, what we need is a plan to actually implement the Children Act 1989 so that we can normalize help seeking from children's services. So that being known to the services carries no more uh, negative connotation than being known to your GP. So that's it for the uh, uh, nature of state intervention. I, I thought a little bit about the variation in services and disproportionality of, of engagement with families that's mentioned. And here the work uh, led by Paul Bywaters and Rick Hood in particular has shone some light uh, on some pretty dark places. I um, mean, it could almost be said that the state punishes families for being poor while simultaneously contributing to and exacerbating their poverty. And I'll leave that thought hanging there for a moment. But what uh, Bibles and, and Hood's work um, illuminates even more clearly is how much more research is needed into the ways different groups in society, whether defined by ethnicity or poverty or, or indeed by the interaction of both, are treated. And if we assume that services are designed to help rather than punish, the question this raises for professional practice in all disciplines and for the communication and engagement strategies is enormous so that people actually are reached by services as opposed to struggling without them. And sadly, this isn't exactly breaking news, but we haven't done much about it as a society. And exposing the impact of varying practice, largely by local authority area, by geography, on the use of statutory versus preventive services, isn't, again, isn't exactly uh, breaking news, but knowing it hasn't led to sufficient change. The quality and focus of professional practice and the system operational style of intervention in a local area clearly leads to different uses of formal intervention that can't be accounted for by socioeconomic variation. This needs much more work, first to understand and then to fix. Um, over the years, I've worked in a number of places with really varied approaches and their populations do not get equal access to the right quality of service. Um, so the review raises questions about risk aversion as well. And there's no doubt in some places that uh, both individual decisions and the system focus are driven more by the question, what's the mistake we most want to avoid than by asking what good can we do here? And the way this feeds into what could best be described as the unwarranted variation in outcomes is complex. And although it doesn't get a mention, I think uh, Ofsted has a part to acknowledge here. Most systems respond to adverse inspection outcomes by, by developing a, a compliance culture. Uh, they also tend to struggle to recruit and retain good staff. Working with complex family dynamics and trying to the relative test the uh, relative benefits of acting or not acting uh, with only a sort of foggy crystal ball telling you what the future might be at your disposal really isn't helped by an obsession with complying with processes which are actually designed more to satisfy inspection criteria than to meet need. Um, Rick Hood's analysis has started to disentangle how the institutional context and organisational structure and, and wider contextual factors contribute to inequalities in provision across the system. And while causes remain unclear, it's definitely going to be more productive in bringing about change if we view them as being linked to the way the system works rather than being the result of human error or bad practice. We have to go forward constructively if we're going to start addressing these, these issues and questions. What we're dealing with is complexity. There are no right answers. Um, everywhere is different and we need to account for that. Finally, um, I wanted to look very briefly at the fragmentation and hollowing out of services issue. Um, and there isn't strong evidence to support an argument that the austerity years, which resulted in the closure of many family support services, has actually caused the number of children under five to be looked after to go up. But the correlation is pretty strong, as is the link with a much larger cuts to gov government funding for those local authorities with the highest levels of deprivation and need. And we've seen that uh, in each round of uh, new spending, uh, the money goes to where the money already is. Um, and the biggest cuts have been to those, the, those local authorities um, with the highest uh, spend linked to the highest levels of need. And the subsequent diversion of both budget and their unavoidable overspends, which have been 
uh, referred to, has clearly moved uh, money away from preventive services to, to the other care and statutory services. And as I said earlier, not with the greatest outcome for many of those children. Um, and although, although the review uh, sort of looks mostly at um, the uh, Nuffield funded uh, research programs, there's a growing body of evidence outside that uh, remit, which demonstrates the effectiveness of integrated interdisciplinary systems uh, that actually take services to families that are struggling, as opposed to expecting those least well organized families in our communities to know which services on offer on that huge chart that, that Jordan showed um, would best help them. And this is particularly true for, for younger children and the parents of younger children. And alongside some of that other research about what, what's working well, there's a family has partnership hanging on by its fingertips. Um, and that's so well evidenced, but um, you know, clearly it isn't being funded at the level it was originally anticipated or will uh, continue to be. Um, so while the review uh, looks at the hollowing out of the system, um, it doesn't really get into that, um, issue about pathways between services. And that's absolutely critical, again, for families that are struggling. Um, pathways between services are controlled by thresholds. Uh, services then seek to protect themselves, as Jordan suggested, by uh, from being overwhelmed by creating barriers. They're really tight on you know, defining what they do and what they therefore won't do. And our compliance culture and our inspection regime actually celebrates the extent to which professionals in different agencies understand and work to the barriers they've created, as opposed to working for children and families. Um, people are, you know, are told by Ofsted and other inspectors that they, their thresholds are well understood and well employed. Um, but all they're doing is, in, 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 is controlling workflow. Uh, they're handing off families from one to another rather than being holistic and focusing on uh, the needs of the child in a family uh, with, with a really complex set of social and economic conditions around. So they were my thoughts in the time I had available. So in summary, there's a lot of good research in there, some answers, but many more questions. Um, and I hope we can now unpack some of those questions. Many thanks, Andrew, for um, the, uh, a really a really interesting and and challenging response um, uh, in terms of the the children's social care system and wider issues. I think there's there's lots in there, um, and we've had quite a lot of questions. I'll just I'll just begin with. I wanted to just probe a little more about um, the nature of the nature of state intervention. And, and your analysis of this sort of shift from, from a welfare to a nanny state. And I was reflecting on the question that the independent review for children's social care is sort of posed for um, its, its work, which is, um, it's really about the, how, how we support um, and, and sort of navigate the sort of, uh, the, the kind of maintaining loving relationships, stability and safety that children's social services have to do when, and, and parents uh, uh, have to do. Um, and whether you think that we've got the balance, I mean, you clearly raised issues about some, the, the issues about the way in which the state intervenes, but have we got the balance right? What do we need to do differently? So maybe to you, Andrew, first. Um. Do we have a balance right? No. Um, the, and I suppose this is, it, it's to do with the way we see, um, and, and this is a really complex issue of language in the media, casual judgmental terms being thrown about, attitudes being reinforced, which generally, um, uh, have led to local authority children's services being seen as the service of last resort. Uh, and uh, whether you go back to the principles of welfare state uh, in, in the 1940s, uh, which have had a lot of airing recently, um, or Children Act 89, Children Act 2004, um, 
government has tried on a number of occasions to establish um, a network of support services which engage in partnership with families, support those that are struggling on the one hand. But on the other hand, has always uh, failed to invest in uh, health interventions for parents with low level um, mental health problems. So you don't qualify as an adult um, because your mental health problems are low level, um, but they do seriously impair your parenting capacity, um, but you don't get services because the threshold for mental health in engagement is, is too high. Uh, same with drug and alcohol. So we've got um, s systems being rationed, which is always going to happen. Um, and alongside that, that rationing has had labels attached, which discourage people from seeing um, social work, for example, as a positive contribution to family life. Um, and then you get I know, the, the red top media um, throwing all their shit at you know, whatever the thing of the day is um, that they, they want to have a go at. And um, the, the cycle doesn't get broken. So um, parents don't actively seek um, local authority services and services haven't got the funding um, to develop that engagement with all aspects of their community um, uh, that, that's required and they don't have the engagement strategies and many, many of them don't have the, the wherewithal or, or, or the, the capacity to think about engagement strategies because they're, they're spending all their time just firefighting. So we haven't reached out to our, our populations. We know a lot about our populations, but we, we haven't done enough to reach, reach out to them and offer them services. Um, and it's interesting, the government's announcement, as opposed to the um, uh, care reviews own paperwork, um, asked a series of questions which underpinned the, the, the care review. And I just look, looked at it and read down the page all the things they wanted to, to, to address. And um, actually, if you reintroduce Sure Start, uh, <laughs> if you reenacted the 2004 Act, you get there. All the stuff that the austerity years took out they're asking, should they bring back in, but without naming it. Um, because that outreach, that use of the knowledge of how to work with families and, and uh, particularly the early years stuff, the early years foundation. I mean, this, we know so much about how to do it, but we haven't got the money to do it. So as a consequence, we've got the balance wrong. We're not doing it. So we're having to step in um, and, uh, uh, and act in a statutory way with a lot of families who are just struggling. Uh, the, 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 and then we don't have the confidence once we've intervened to pass power back to families because we're not doing enough uh, restorative work, we're not doing enough uh, parent support, uh, family group conferencing isn't well enough rolled out. All those sorts of things um, are getting in the way. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I wondered, Jordan, is it, could you just um, bring in the work on, on um, the born into care work, which I think is interesting in terms of some of the things it's raising in relation to, to mental health and, and, and different ways of supporting that group of, of parents. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I would, I'm paraphrasing some of Karen and her team's work here. But I think in relation to that, I mean, I think some of it is about bolstering the support to struggling families and young and unborn children, as you say, Andrew. And so part of their work as part of that born into care research showed quite clearly, I think, that professionals in the system are really quite limited in their options to improve parenting capacity before removal. So I, I know that they did a, a sort of bunch of round tables, I think around 60 with professionals around the country to work out why there was such a marked difference in, in vari and variation in rates. And interestingly, I think there was a broad agreement of the practical things that could be done to lower the rates of newborn and infant removal. But many you know, talked about budget and resource constraints and a lack of integration with health services, um, rather than a lack of awareness of different ways of working. So I know that you know, in, in, in that work, that there's a lot of talk about specialist pre-birth teams and they're seen as really quite highly affected, um, effective, sorry. Um, and dedicated parent and baby placements. But the, you know, the practice and sort of access to this varied considerably across England. So I guess in, in relation to, and answer this in, to this question in relation to, to infants, I think that work sort of argues that 
we probably need to build up our preventative services and to improve that interface between children's services and health services when care proceedings are issued at birth to give professionals, I guess, that, that flexibility to seek all support before a newborn or infant is, is removed. And I think it's probably also worth mentioning something around the sort of very strong argument and evidence for continued work with parents beyond the conclusion of proceedings um, to prevent sort of re repeat interaction with the family court. Um, so as many of you know, um, there's a large body of evidence now on repeat removals shortly after birth. And despite this, we know that support for parents beyond child removal is you know, neither mainstream nor mandated in policy. Um, and I think it's more about shifting to that long-term focus beyond the immediate proceedings as well. So we know that you know, there's great initiatives like PAUSE and other things that have really positive outcomes, you know, evaluated outcomes are often at risk because they rely on sort of skeletal or short-term funding. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I mean, as I said, paraphrasing Karen's research, but hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Come, um, come back on yes, that. Yes, yes right. thank you. I'm absolutely right. And, and um, but it, what it demonstrates is, is some really poor quality decision making uh, by services as well. Um, all that po you talk about, you know, really intensive pre-birth work. Yeah, I agree that is 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 missing in, in some cases, but, but actually, the post-birth work has as, as much uh, relevance here. Um, what we know about uh, from things like pause, and, and it's complex, but but um, uh, what we know about uh, parents' feelings of self-worth, that you know, the, the, their need to, to be given space to, to uh, uh, grow as individuals, um, to be supported on, on a journey which enables them to make a choice to not have another child who's going to be taken away, is long-term. It's a relationship-based. It's um, a commitment by somebody to a family to just be there, um, as, as well as to use those evidence-informed uh, interactions. But it's actually really cheap compared to the cost of care proceedings and the cost of the next child being in care. And that's, what, that's, that's the sort of bad, bad quality decision making. But because we've got locked into spending and indeed massively overspending our budgets on things we can't avoid, you know, the cost of a foster placement, we, we've, we've lost the ability to spend other money on things which we know will prevent spending further down the line. Um, it's, it's not even hypothetical this is you know, the evidence is really strong absolutely um uh i fear that we are now we are and i, I can't believe it we're already up for time so we've really only um touched on uh, many of the key issues there is a stream of really important questions some about data um and 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 what is actually available and where there's progress there are also questions about um, uh, co-designing services, uh, uh, lots and lots of things. And we will come back to all of those questions. Apologies that we've not been able to do that in the time today. Um, and a key part of the way in which we want to uh, um, do this, this series is to engage with people. And, and there is a, a section on the website um, in relation to um, uh, the, the changing face of early childhood where you could submit comments so we will come back to you with answers to your questions also just to clarify that actually we have published the report um, Andrew maybe I think you might have seen an earlier version but the report has been published today and is available on our website so so do go and have a look that may generate other questions I think the things um, that I am left with are um, they're clearly the the kind of shift, the shift from, from early intervention to late intervention and the, the fact that there really are hugely missed opportunities to be able to respond uh, to young children's needs in this particularly important phase of life. That would be both much better for those children, but also uh, um, uh, potentially prevent, prevent costs later on. And that given the pressures that there are, uh, financial pressures and demand pressures that we really have got to be imaginative about um, how we do this, learning the lessons from uh, uh, many of the earlier, earlier um, uh, 
services like Sure Start and the role of his health visitors in public health. Um, but, but having to do that in a new context, also with new ways of working, a lot of the digital ways we uh, had to work um, in, during the pandemic, uh, while they're not unproblematic, but also have op you know, opened up new, new opportunities for us. And I think the other key thing, and again, it's an issue raised in the question, which is some of the issues around poverty and deprivation, which is children's social services, um, will and can and need to change, but so do the other services that surround uh, children's lives, both adult services and universal services. And, and we must be able to get more out of the out of that join up and 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 find more successful ways of integrating and coordinating than we have done so far. Although in many areas they are trying and testing out new things. So I'm going to to. to close down now but really first of all many many thanks um, to to Andrew for for coming in and, and responding to the work um, uh, that Jordan and and I have done on uh, on this area but also to to them to the many researchers that that work is 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 you know drawing from this is Nuffield funded work we haven't done the work ourselves but um, the really, really important and groundbreaking work, as well as other, other researchers that we drew upon. And also to all of you for coming to the session. And uh, we will come back to you and hopefully this will be the beginning of a conversation uh, that we can return to. So many thanks indeed. And we'll close down now.